University. He's a practicing diagnostic and interventional neuroradiologist who specializes in the diagnosis and minimally invasive treatment of ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke. Dr. Hyde's research seeks to understand the pathophysiologic basis of cerebrovascular diseases. In addition, his group is developing new minimally invasive image guided treatments for ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke. He is author of more than 150 publications and is an investigator of multiple grants, including the CRISP II diffuse three studies, as well as the, he's also the co-PI of the NIH funded precise basal thrombectomy study. Uh, there are many more things to say about uh, Dr. Jeremy Hyde. We are really grateful for you to be with us here and welcome. You can share your screen. Well, thanks for having me. Thanks for that kind introduction there, Dr. Costa. Let me just share these slides. All right. Okay, well, thank you all very much to the, the folks at, at Swedish and to the Seattle Science Foundation uh, for having me. I'm going to give you guys a real kind of tour de force of CT perfusion uh, and its use for the evaluation of ischemic stroke patients before thrombectomy. Uh, these are my disclosures. I do uh, do some consulting work for Schema View that uh, does make software that processes perfusion software. So that's the most pertinent one. So I'm gonna spend a, a, just a couple of minutes to talk about stroke physiology for some of the people who may be less familiar. And it's very important for the background of CT perfusion to know a little bit about that. And then we'll get into the CTP technique and then how we use it for thrombectomy triage. Um, I'll talk about a few of the pitfalls that we commonly see, and then really kind of get into how we're using this in uh, modern stroke practices. But let's start talking about stroke physiology. So most of the folks here know this, but an ischemic stroke occurs when you disrupt blood flow to the brain. And that's usually in a cervical or a cerebral artery. We can see here's a patient who has blockage of the first part of the middle cerebral artery on the left, which is shown with this yellow arrow. And that has caused this stroke that we see on the MRI in blue here um, in the patient's basal ganglia. So when you have disruption of blood flow to the brain, there's really two things that can happen to the brain tissue. So some components of the brain are very dependent on the blood flow to provide the nutrients to keep the cells alive. And when you shut that off, some part of the brain will die. And that's kind of schematized here in red. But typically there's a larger part of brain tissue that surrounds that area that is starved for blood flow, but there is enough collateral blood flow to keep it alive. So not enough blood flow that works, but enough that it's still surviving. And that's tissue that's at risk of dying if we don't restore blood flow. And the terms for these two compartments that you've probably all heard is the ischemic core, referring to what we think is permanently dead tissue, and the penumbra for this potentially savable tissue um, that is lacking blood flow. Okay, so if a patient comes into your ED and you're looking at them and they have stroke symptoms, you think that their brain probably looks something like this. They've got some component of dead ischemic core and then they've got some component of salvageable penumbra surrounding that tissue and you need to take care of them. So if you are able to restore blood flow to the brain and reperfuse them, well, this salvageable penumbra goes back to normal and the patient is left with the same amount of dead tissue as they came in with. And that's a patient who's got the best chance of doing really well. But if you are unable to open up that blocked blood vessel and restore blood flow and there's no reperfusion, well, guess what? This penumbra goes on and it also dies. And then the patient ends up with a much larger area of dead brain tissue and that portends a worse prognosis. So really what we're trying to do with all of our patients is get prompt restoration of blood flow to the brain either with intravenous thrombolysis or with endovascular thrombectomy procedures. So just a couple of examples to illustrate this point. This is a gentleman who was raking in his front yard. He collapsed, was witnessed by his family, uh, was brought to an outside hospital and promptly transferred to Stanford. And he had a very high stroke scale. And this is his initial diffusion weighted MRI. We see just the faintest bit of an ischemic core here in the left caudate head. Uh, this is his perfusion imaging, which we'll start to talk about a little bit more in a minute. And we see a lot of delayed blood flow in the left middle cerebral artery territory. This is a good thrombectomy candidate. The arrow here is showing you the block left M1 segment. Here's the blood flow being restored. And even though he had all this tissue at risk, because everything was restored, he ends up with the same amount of dead tissue as he started with. And this is a patient who had a fantastic outcome. And that differs from this patient. So this is a different patient now with a little bit of ischemic core in the right basal ganglia, but the similarly a large area of ischemic penumbra surrounding the tissue. And here is the patient's right M1 occlusion. Now this was one of these clots we just couldn't get out. 
you work and you work and work and you can't restore the blood flow. And so this patient was not revascularized and the brain was not reperfused. And because of that, he had all this tissue at risk. And sure enough, his ischemic core grows into that tissue and this patient has a worse outcome. Okay, so those are two real examples that just underpinned uh, the idea of stroke treatment, which is that we really wanna restore blood flow to the brain. So let's talk about CT perfusion. So if these two different components of brain are important to identify, we need to have tools to image them. And that's where CT perfusion comes in. Now, the core and the penumbra are two compartments that we can see using CT perfusion imaging, which is really physiologic imaging. And these are just two examples that are here showing you the core here in pink and the penumbra here in green. And we'll get into more details how exactly we do this. You can even flag other parts of brain such as subacute infarcts using modern technology. So why do we need CTP? Okay, well, what does it do? Well, number one, it helps us confirm the presence of a stroke. Uh, it will help us estimate and then quantify the ischemic core and penumbra compartments. And then we can look at those results and help make thrombectomy treatment decisions in our patients. So here's an example of the utility of it. So this is one of my patients. This is a 73-year-old male coming in with you know, left side of paralysis, a high stroke scale. Here is the patient's non-con CT, and here's the CT angiogram. The blue arrow is showing us blockage of the first part of the right middle cerebral artery. And when we look at the CT, we're trying to judge how much injury to the brain there is. And I put this up on, a, on purpose because there are findings, they're hard to see. So when we look at the lentiform nucleus here on the right side, we see a subtle loss of density in this area. The rest of the brain seems to look okay, but it's hard to see. By contrast, when we look at the CT perfusion results in this patient, we can more easily see what we think is the ischemic core. We can even get a volume of it, which is 23 milliliters. And then we can very easily see the penumbra, which is shown here in green, and the volume of the penumbra here of 165 milliliters. And we know that there's a difference between these two, so clearly, there's a lot more brain tissue at risk of dying than we think is already dead. And it's very easy to see this, and that really can help you make uh, triage decisions promptly. So how do we get these images? Well, let's spend a couple minutes talking about CT perfusion technique. So the basic idea for CTP is you inject contrast into a vein, and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna take multiple pictures of the brain over and over and over as that contrast flows through the arteries up to the brain tissue, and then out through the veins that exit the brain. And by doing that, we can take all of that data we acquired and then process it into these different perfusion image maps. The common maps that people talk about, just so everyone's heard the names, are CBV, which is cerebral blood volume, CBF, which is cerebral blood flow, MTT is used at some places, that's mean transit time to help estimate the penumbra, and then other places use Tmax for the time to maximum of the residue function to estimate the ischemic penumbra. So this is an example of what the raw data look like. The affected hemisphere is shown in yellow, and we can see the contrast now flowing in. And I'll let this loop a couple times, but you can see the contrast is white, it's in the arteries. And as it flows through, you can actually see a difference in density between the two halves of brain. The left side is normal and the right side is lacking a little bit of blood flow. So if we watch here, you can see that it is a little bit less dense here. And as you are not only getting that density difference, we're getting density difference information over time. And here's just a still frame midway through and you can see in this area that it's less white, there's less density, and that shows you that there's less blood flow to this ischemic brain tissue. So we need to specify a few different key parts um, of the anatomy to help us process the data and get these perfusion maps. So we need an arterial input function, which is shown here in red. This one has been placed on the basilar apex. And we need a venous outflow uh, site, which has been placed here near the torcula. And what you're gonna do is by pre-selecting these areas, then we can measure the change in density over time as we inject that contrast. And you get a curve that looks like this. So we've got a change in CT density on the y-axis versus time on the x-axis. And if you look at these graphs, it kind of physiologically makes sense. So we see the arterial input function rises quickly and steeply before the venous peak, which makes sense. The blood's got to go through the artery before it can get to the vein. And then each of these trails off and they reach a new baseline that's basically a blood flow, a uh, blood pool kind of phase that's above the baseline before there was any contrast circulating throughout the patient's body. And so if you kind of put these two together and we watch as the scan starts, you can see as the contrast flows in, 
this rises up, trails down, the Venus outflow rises up, trails down next, and you get that new leveling off with a baseline that's a blood pool phase. Okay, so that's how you do it. So you're gonna get information that looks like this throughout the whole brain tissue, and then you just have to do the math. I can get my kids to help me with this, but basically these are the different areas we can measure. And if you measure them, that gives you information about cerebral blood flow, cerebral blood volume, Tmax, mean transit time, and you just literally apply that math to each area and you can color code it to get these perfusion maps that look like this. So this is a patient that looks like they have a right M1 occlusion. When we look here at the cerebral blood flow, we see very dark blue. So this is a patient who's got really reduced blood flow. And that kind of fits with a very prolonged and red time to maximum, a very red and prolonged mean transit time. But fortunately on the non-con CT, we don't see a lot of ischemic injury. This is probably someone that you could really help if you can open up that blood vessel. Okay, so I think hopefully just kind of visually seeing these pictures, uh, you can understand how they're helpful in, in making treatment decisions. And I think it's really remarkable how much information you can summarize very succinctly with these perfusion parameter maps. And that's especially useful when you're talking about moving a patient from one hospital that does not have a neurointerventionalist to a hospital that does have a neurointerventionalist capable of doing a thrombectomy procedure. We'll talk about that in a minute. So what about quality? When you're looking at CTP image maps, you wanna make sure that your data that generate the images are good. And so you've gotta do your own kind of QI check. So here's a nice looking curve from a patient. This is slides courtesy from the folks at Rapid. And when we look at this, we can actually plot the patient's motion to make sure they're not moving all over. Because if they're moving all over, that may degrade the dose, uh, the dose time curve, which may degrade our images. And here we can see that the patient is not rotating in the X, Y, or Z axis, and they're not translating or moving in the X, Y, and Z axis. So there's very minimal movement here. And that's what you wanna see. And that contrasts with a graph that looks like this. So this is a little bit different, right? The arterial input function is coming up before the venous outflow function, but the peak is very broad. The peak is very broad for the venous outflow function. They kind of slowly trail off to a very late time. They don't level off like we showed you. And so you'd be concerned just based on the appearance of this alone. When we look at these motion maps, we can see that right around 35 seconds, the patient starts moving all over the place. And that's gonna give you a poor uh, dose uh, concentration curve, uh, sorry, a, a concentration uh, time curve. And then your images are gonna be corrupt, which means you may inadvertently uh, have errors in your core and your per number of volumes. Okay, so it's important to kind of understand how we get these images. And I would just emphasize all of you who are doing CTP, always quality check um, your, your source data and your, your maps like or the um, uh, graphs like that to make sure you're dealing with technically acceptable scans before you go and interpret the parameter maps. And that's the first thing that I do and is the first thing I teach our residents and fellows to do. So if you would like to read a little bit more about the details, there's a couple of reviews that I've written um, over the years that has quite a bit more excruciating detail about CTP technique, but I wanna pivot away from the technique to talk about thrombectomy and the role of CTP uh, that it plays in triaging these patients. So this is one of my patients undergoing a thrombectomy. You can see with the yellow arrow, we're looking here at a left M1 occlusion. This middle panel here shows the thrombectomy procedure being performed. And this is literally a procedure to drag that clot out of the artery that's blocking. Uh, that's blocking it. And then you're able to restore blood flow, which is shown here with complete revascularization of the left middle cerebral artery. So this procedure is remarkably effective. Um, it is very well validated in randomized trials. So these are studies that look like internal carotid artery or proximal middle cerebral artery, large vessel occlusions. Each little area on the x-axis is the study, and then the thrombectomy arm is in red versus the medical arm in blue. The y-axis is the percentage of patients who are achieving a good outcome, meaning they're functionally independent 90 days after treatment. And you can see in every single study, the endovascular arm just absolutely trumps the medical arm. This is a very effective therapy. The studies to the left of the dashed line are the so-called early window studies that were performed in roughly zero to six hours from the patient's symptom onset. And then we have our two late window studies, Dawn and Diffuse 3, that looked at patients presenting six to 16 or six to 24 hours after symptom onset. And so if you look at all of these data, the number of patients you need to treat to benefit one is only two to three. 
And that's really quite remarkable. And if you compare that to the number of patients you need to treat with an ST elevation, a myocardial infarction to benefit one, that number is somewhere around 17. And think about the systems that we've put in place to take care of cardiac patients um, compared to the systems we're now putting in place to take care of stroke patients. This is much more effective um, in terms of impact to patient care than taking a patient to the cath lab for a cardiac angioplasty or stent placement. So a really big advance for the treatment of our patients. And we need now tools to help take care of these patients expeditiously um, and accurately. And that's where CTP comes in. So if you actually look at what was the imaging strategy used in these studies, four of the studies that I've shown here all use CT perfusion imaging to select patients for treatment. And that's an important concept. So how do we actually do that? Well, who is an optimal thrombectomy candidate and what should they look like? There are many different ways to talk about this. Um, and there are, I think, a lot of active changes in who we think is a good thrombectomy candidate. But I think right now, fundamentally, they all kind of fit this picture. You, you need three things. They should have a relatively small ischemic core. They should have a larger penumbra so that if you open up this large vessel occlusion that they also need to have, you're actually saving some blood tissue. And there are many different techniques that people do to identify these candidates, but I would argue that we're all trying to find this same patient. So small core, big penumbra, large vessel occlusion that we can get to, really quite simple in some sense. So let's talk about the core, because I think that that's probably, in my opinion, the most important part of this. So we mentioned the ischemic core, like we think this is the tissue that's likely irreversibly dead. We don't think we can save it. Even if we restore blood flow to this brain, it's dead, it's gone, it's not gonna come back. And this is a diffusion weighted image from an MRI, and this is the gold standard, right? So this is the best we've got right now to image the ischemic core. It is much easier to see the core on a DWI image than it is on any CT scan. But CT perfusion types helps to get us close. And why does this matter? Well, here's a patient example. This is a 59-year-old AFib, stroke scale of 16. They have a right M1 occlusion. We can see on the CT perfusion image, relatively small ischemic core is estimated here, less than 10 milliliters, and a much larger penumbra here on the uh, CT perfusion Tmax map. This patient gets a successful thrombectomy. And because of that, this core doesn't get any bigger. But more importantly, How'd the patient do? Well, he ends up with a very small final infarct volume. His discharge stroke scale is zero, and he has a modified Rankin scale of zero three months after treatment, which means he basically is completely independent and normal. So how do we image the core if it is important in selecting our patients? Well, you can do a few things if you're using CT. You can try to get some quantitative information um, by looking at a non-contrast CT. And a really common way to make that more quantitative is to use aspects, which I'll talk about in a minute, or we can use CTP techniques. And so the Alberta Stroke Program Early CT Score is that's, a, that's what aspect stands for. And this is a useful tool, but it is a challenging tool. But what you do is you break up the middle cerebral artery into these 10 standardized regions, and they're kind of shown here. And then you look at the images of your patient. And if you have a loss of density in these areas, you take off a point. So there are 10 possible points, but each area that's injured, you lose a point. And so that's helpful, it's quantitative, and you wanna have someone be as close to 10 as possible. But the problem is if Dr. Costa reads this versus if I read this versus Dr. McDougall, we will all probably give you different numbers. We're probably close to each other, but we're not gonna perfectly agree. And that can be problematic when you start to say, well, what's the threshold at which we think someone's going to benefit? And if we disagree close to that threshold, then it becomes a little bit difficult to know which patients are optimally treated and who's likely to do well. So here's an example of aspects. This is an 86-year-old with left-sided paralysis, high stroke scale. Uh, we see on the CT angiogram that there's a right M1 occlusion shown by the yellow arrow. And here's the non-contrast CT. So I've windowed this to help us see that that density difference. And when we do that, we see that this is a little bit more black, meaning there's a little bit of injury here and edema and fluid. And if we assign the aspects points, we lose the M2 region, we lose the insula here, and we lose this part of the lentiform nucleus, gives us an aspect score of seven. That's a good number. We should treat that patient. And here they are getting a successful thrombectomy. So right now, most people are saying your aspect score should be six or higher for them to be a good thrombectomy candidate. This is with state of it as we're talking to each other here in 2022, um, that may change. And we'll mention that in just a minute. 
The good thing about Aspects is it does standardize our assessment of brain injury, and it really is hard. And I really can't emphasize this. Um, you can take very good experienced neuroradiologists, very good experienced neurointerventionalists, and again, everyone disagrees when you look at these pictures. It's subjective, it's challenging, and that leads to this poor inter-rater agreement. Um, I do think it'll be interesting to see if uh, artificial intelligence assisted aspects is more accurate. There are some emerging data that suggests that it is, and that may help us standardize our assessments a little bit better. Okay, so CTP, does it do better than aspects in terms of estimating the core? And I would argue that it probably does. Um, so we've already talked about how we, you know, do CTP and what we do to estimate the core is we take that data and we are going to delineate a volume. And what you can do is you say, well, what do we think really estimates the core? And you set a threshold. And so much of the commercial vendors that are out there are using either cerebral blood flow or cerebral blood volume to estimate the core. And what you do is you look at a drop in those components relative to the normal hemisphere. And so if you look here, this says CBF less than 30%. So it's 30% cerebral blood flow compared to this side um, of the brain, which is normal. So if you have a 70% reduction in cerebral blood flow, we think that that is the ischemic core that's not gonna come back. Okay, this is vendor specific. Uh, there's a whole host of post-processing techniques. So there is a little bit of a lack of standardization, but at least we've got some, some kind of guardrails and rules that we think about. So how do we know we are accurately assessing the core? So you see this you know, 30% number, where does that come from and is it accurate? Well, guess what? It's actually not, but it's purposely not. And so commercial software in general is undercalling the ischemic core. And it's funny, I hear this all the time when I give talks and go to meetings and people say, you know, perfusion imaging is totally inaccurate. Uh, I'll get an MRI after I treat a patient and the volume estimation was just way off. Uh, it's always, you know, 15, 20 mils off. And I say, well, that's what it's supposed to do. And here's a paper that shows that. So what this, this study from Carlos Rita did is they asked, okay, let's get a CT perfusion study and then let's get an MRI shortly after that. And we'll use the MRI to show us what the actual ischemic core is. And then what we can do is we can use our CTP data. We'll ask, well, which cerebral blood flow threshold best estimates that volume that we're seeing on the MRI? And that's what's shown here. So if you take the diffusion weighted core from the MRI minus the CTP estimated core at these various reductions in CBF, which one best fits. And it looks like here, the best agreement is actually a cerebral blood flow of 38%. But we just talked about that we really use 30% most of the time. Why is that? Well, it undercalls the core by about 15 milliliters. And the reason the software does this is there are always a few patients where CTP doesn't quite work perfectly. And the danger could be if you selected this 38% threshold, those few patients, you may think the core is bigger than it actually is. And you don't want to inadvertently exclude a patient from treatment by thinking the core is too big. And so you can kind of cheat a little bit and say, well, let's just change our estimation. Let's say that across the board for everybody, we'll just consistently underestimate the core, but that will help make sure we don't hurt those few patients by not offering them treatment when they think that they would likely benefit. That's important to understand. I think a lot of people don't really recognize that, but that was done, I think, thoughtfully and on purpose. Okay, so another important point about CT perfusion imaging is it really closely relates to the hemodynamic status of the patient but it's their hemodynamic status at the time you are acquiring the images, right? You're not really getting historical information about what happened to their brain. Um, can you predict the future? I'm gonna show you some data that maybe we can actually predict the future, which is pretty useful, but you're really taking a snapshot of their physiology at the time you perform the scan. And that's really important because that leads to some pitfalls, okay? Well, let's look at this patient, 69 year old female, left hemiplegia, she has a right gaze preference, a very high stroke scale. And this is what her CT perfusion uh, images look like, all right? So we see a pretty small looking core here, uh, and certainly a penumbra that's much larger. This is the second slice going all the way up to the vertex. But overall, you're looking at this and it looks like there's a pretty good mismatch. So this is someone that would probably be a very good thrombectomy candidate. But remember, we took a snapshot at some point in their physiology, so we're not done. We can't just go off of these images. We need to look a little more closely. And in particular, if you look at these two slices, you'll notice this area here, 
So this is a grayscale map, but there's really like the density here in this part of the middle cerebral artery territory, it's pretty dark, which suggests the blood flow is down. And that is, you know, within this area of penumbra. So this looks like it's matched, but when I see this, it, things like this, where it's, it's dark and the density is low, it's really important to look at the non-contrast CT. And when you do that, you might see this, All right? So here's the same patient's non-contrast CT. And the problem is, the ischemic core is clearly much bigger than CTP is estimating, right? This is a much larger area of injury that's that's pretty easy to see even on these images than that, you know, five milliliters or so that our CTP told us it should be. You always have to look at the non-contrast CT. And so why do these two different? What, why do they look so different? And this is the MRI afterwards, and we can see that there really was essentially no mismatch. Well, what happened here? So the brain tissue is dead, not the arteries, all right? So remember when you do CT perfusion imaging, you are using blood flow to estimate what's going on in the brain tissue, but you can have recruitment of collateral blood flow to brain that's injured, but it can get recruited too late. So if the brain tissue is dead and then there's delayed recruitment of blood, of blood flow, and then you take a picture, your blood flow is gonna make the brain look like it's doing better than it is. The brain tissue is dead, not the arteries, okay? So you can have a completely, um, a brain that's entirely dead, but the arteries are open and you may look like you don't have a very large ischemic core on CT perfusion. And the point is that it's really critical that you always look at the non-contrast CT just to confirm what you're seeing on these very quick to look at summary maps, and that's important. Some of you might've heard of another pitfall of CTP, which is the ghost core. So the ghost core, is this tendency of CT perfusion to overestimate the size of the core in hyperacute stroke patients. And what do we mean by that? Well, these are patients who present within the first hour, hour and a half after the symptom onset. And the danger of this error is that you may inappropriately exclude patients from treatment if you're not aware of the ghost core. Here's a couple of, of good publications I recommend on this topic uh, mentioned down here as well. So here's one example. So this is a patient who has a right M1 occlusion and they get this CT scan and CT perfusion study an hour after the symptom onset. So they really got to the healthcare system quickly. And what do we see? Well, on the non-contrast CT, their aspects is 10. This is really a completely normal looking brain. We don't get any hints uh, that there's a stroke going on. And when we look at the CTP, we see that there's a core of 38 milliliters, clearly a much larger penumbra of 145. So this is a great treatment candidate and the patient was taken for treatment. And because of this estimation of the core, we're gonna to expect to see that the temporal lobe has a pretty big infarct after we treat them if we're successful. The patient was completely revascularized, a perfect result in the cath lab. And here is their MRI 24 hours after they were treated. And here's their MRI a month later. And look at this, where is that big temporal lobe infarct that we should see? It's not there. All I see is a little stroke here in the external capsule. That's it. This is minuscule. It's less than a milliliter. We were expecting like a 34 milliliter stroke. And just to confirm, this is not some pseudo normalization. We still only see this sliver of chronic infarct a month later. So this tells us our CTP really overestimated the size of the ischemic core. Even though it was small and the patient still got treated, you can imagine that that could be a problem when you're trying to triage a patient. And this is the example of the ghost core. So in these really early time windows, CTP will overestimate your core. And here's the real risk of this. This is another patient that um, I was made aware of. This is an 88 year old female, right IC occlusion, very high stroke scale. And here's the internal carotid artery occlusion on the CTA. And then, you know, on this non-contrast CT, there's some sort of chronic changes in an 88 year old, but not a whole lot of massive injury that we're seeing. What does our CTP show? Well, it estimates that the core is 79 milliliters. All right, so that's a pretty good size core, even though there's a much larger, you know, penumbra um, uh, that's, you know, mismatched to this and that's bigger. Some people would say a core of 79 and an 88 year old, this is someone you don't want to treat, but you want to know that this is accurate. And this patient is being scanned only 31 minutes into their stroke. So you've got to worry about the ghost core. And what should we do in this situation? Well, similar to what I showed you um, earlier, what if we just adjust our threshold a little bit to account for the early time that we're scanning? And so what if we nudge it down and we say, let's go from the standard threshold of 30 
down to a, a more stringent cerebral blood flow of 20%. And what does that do to the volume? Well, it goes from a 79 to a 22. And this actually in these hyperacute time windows seems to better estimate the core. And it's a big difference in core volume. So the point being, if you are scanning a patient um, in the you know, early the 60 to 90 minutes after their symptom onset, don't necessarily use the cerebral blood flow 30%. Look at these type of maps and adjust your core estimation down. Then that will make sure you're giving the patient the benefit of the doubt and not thinking their core is larger than it is. Why does this happen? What I think is going on is when you block blood flow to the brain, your brain has to adapt to that ischemic challenge. And there's a whole lot that suddenly goes on. The arteries will start to dilate up to maximize blood flow. If there's the ability to recruit collateral blood flow from other arteries that are open adjacent to the area, the brain starts to do that. But that is not a process that's like a light switch, right? This takes some time to pull all the blood flow in. And if you take a picture too early in that process when the brain is actively adapting, you may not be taking a picture when the patient's really at their best. You know, if you wait a little bit longer, they may really be maximally adapted to that challenge with all this collateral blood flow coming in. But if you catch it early on, you may look like their blood flow is worse than it actually is. And I think that's probably why we see these sort of ghost core problems and overestimate the size of the core when we take really, really early pictures versus if we were able to take it a little bit later, um, then we might see that they're doing better after they've maximally accommodated to the challenge. Okay, so I've showed you a lot of examples of, you know, estimating the ischemic core volume uh, and the, you know, the utility of having a nice quantitative number. How does that actually interact with patient outcome and does it matter? Well, there are good data that shows that the likelihood of having a good outcome is inversely correlated to the size of the core, right? So a patient who has just a tiny little bit of ischemic core is much more likely to have a good outcome than someone over here that has a very large ischemic core. Their likelihood of good outcome is gonna be much less. And that's actually backed up in the literature, which I'll show you in a second. So right now, when we estimate the core, we're typically kind of looking at a core threshold of 50 to 70 milliliters as our cutoff in terms of who we think benefits. So patients with cores that are particularly larger than 70 milliliters, we really kind of say, well, we don't really know if they're likely to benefit from a thrombectomy. And that's also similar to the idea of treating patients with the higher aspects, okay? But we don't actually know if that's the best threshold, okay? So some patients with large cores can do really well. And this is fortunately being investigated right now in a lot of ongoing randomized trials, Tension Last, Tesla Select 2, and hopefully we'll start to hear the results of these studies in the next year or two. Um, and that's important because there may be other people that benefit from treatment than we're currently aware of. And this is just one case to, to provide a little um, thought about this. So this is a 60 year old male with a right M1 occlusion. We've seen here, again, a high stroke scale, and this is an MR angiogram. And when we look at this patient's perfusion imaging, this is a pretty big core and it's a diffusion weighted image core, right? So this is something that is uh, not really gonna be prone to some of the estimation uh, issues of CTP that we talked about. This is likely to be very, very accurate. And they do have a larger penumbra, okay? So there is still, you know, a 70 plus milliliter difference in volume. So, you know, I think most people would look at this core and say, that's pretty big. But I think what we need to do is start to look at the brain tissue. And when we do that, here's the part of the brain that's not dead yet that is within this penumbra. And this is important because this is your pre and post central gyri. This is your motor and sensory strip on the right side of the brain, these are the areas that we think may really drive outcome much more than you know, this temporal lobe and frontal lobe infarcts. And so this might actually be someone you can still benefit and improve their symptoms. So this patient underwent a thrombectomy. Here's the partially occlusive uh, clot in the distal M1 segment on the initial angiogram. Uh, that was opened up. There was a distal embolus uh, into the angular artery afterwards that I'm not showing you on the lateral. And here's the patient's MRI uh, when we started. And then here's the follow-up MRI. And so because of that angular artery thrombus, the core did get a little bit better, or a little bit larger, excuse me. So, you know, not great, but how did this patient do clinically? Well, guess what? They went from a core of 108 to 136, but their stroke scale 24 hours was two. And that's kind of really surprising for a patient with a core that's this large. And how can that possibly be? Well, if we look at their final core here, look at what was spared. 
So fortunately, there was sparing of the motor strip and the sensory strip and the patient's neglect improved. So this patient actually did remarkably well despite having a really large core. Okay. So topography really matters when you think about these patients. All right, you've got to look at not only the size of the core, but what part of the brain is being affected. And how does core volume and outcome play out? Well, this is a really nice study from the Hermes collaboration. Um, Bruce Campbell was the first author on this study. And if you look at this, this is graphing on the, the y-axis, what's the likelihood of functional independence versus the core volume? And as we've been talking about this, what we see is the bigger your core volume, the likelihood of a good outcome goes down, okay? But they've nicely graphed patients who underwent thrombectomy versus medical therapy, because these are data that were derived from our early window randomized trials. And what you do see though, is there's still a treatment effect. Okay, so despite the, the fact that whatever group you're in, the larger your core, the less likely you are to be independent, it still shows that thrombectomy does have a treatment benefit. And so we can conclude that core does correlate with the likelihood of a good outcome, but it does not necessarily modify the thrombectomy treatment effect. And that's important for the field to recognize and the field does recognize that. And we need to generate more data to really push and see if patients with larger cores can do better. And I think we're likely also to learn that we're gonna have to start paying more attention to the areas of the brain that we're potentially salvaging. Okay. So let's talk about port, core and penumbra delineation. So, you know, we've put this slide up before. And again, what we really want to see is a patient with a small core and a large penumbra who has a large vessel occlusion. And so let's spend a minute to talk about this distinction between core and penumbra. So I'm going to make an argument that perfusion imaging is precision imaging. And the way that we used to take care of stroke patients and when we were just doing uh, intravenous thrombolysis, we were really on the clock, right? Their treatment was based upon how long since they were last seen normal. And that really guided everything that we do. And this is a, an old church tower in, in Nantucket. Um, you know, I know we're all on, on the West Coast here, but if you guys ever get back east, this is a, just an absolutely lovely island off the coast of uh, Cape Cod in, in Massachusetts. So what we can do instead is what if we use physiology? And that's really a, the idea of the core and penumbra imaging, right? So here, this patient has a core, but it is smaller than this penumbra. So if we're open up this blocked internal carotid artery, we should be able to save this brain and improve their outcome. Whereas a patient like this, the core and the penumbra seem to be roughly the same size. And so if we open up this proximal M1 occlusion, does it matter? Well, probably not, right? Because we're not really saving a whole lot of brain. And that's the idea of a mismatch or a match deficit. And it's an example of how physiology is really guiding our treatment rather than the time from last seen normal. And that's a big, big change. So why does that matter? Well, let's look at these three patients and imagine you're taking care of them and then start to think about what would happen without knowing all the imaging about I'm about to show you. These are three different patients. They were all last seen normal, six and a half to seven hours. So, you know, within 30 minutes of each other, and they all have an M1 occlusion on their MR angiogram, okay? Their stroke scales, by the way, are also within two points of each other. So they look clinically similar. They've got the same artery blocked. We look at their MR perfusion and, you know, they all have pretty similarly sized penumbras. So, so far they kind of look identical, but what about their core? Well, look at their cores, right? Same time from last seen normal, same severity of symptoms, but their cores are vastly different. These two patients have pretty small ischemic cores. This patient has a large core, all right? These two likely are gonna benefit from a thrombectomy. This patient probably way less likely to. And so that really is showing you by imaging this individual patient's physiology, um, you're really doing precision medicine. And it turns out that how quickly patients grow their core is widely variable. So these are data from Diffuse 2. These are patients with ICA or MCA occlusions when their onset time was known. And this is graphing, well, what's the core volume versus time from onset? And it's all over the place. Everyone is totally different. You could be this patient out here at 11 hours with a really small core, or you could be this patient at a little over two hours with a huge core. So it depends on our individual physiology. And that's where using physiologic imaging to really understand an individual patient's uh, physiology and profile really matters rather than relying on something like the clock. So we're moving from the clock into physiologic imaging. And I think that that's really the way to think about how we take care of our stroke patients. Okay, so 
that's a lot of background about CTP and kind of imaging of it. How does this really guide our stroke treatment? Well, I've been hinting at this, but these are kind of the key areas that I think that CTP does. Um, it estimates the core. We've talked about that. We're now going to spend just a few more slides on mismatch identification and then briefly talk about extended window thrombolysis. So I don't think we need to say much more on this. I provided you data that small core uh, means you're more likely to have a good outcome than a large core. And we talked about the need to do further studies to adjust our threshold. But let's talk a little bit more about this concept of mismatch identification. So here is a patient with an estimated core of zero and a big penumbra right? There is a mismatch between the core and the penumbra. This is someone that's likely to be a good treatment candidate. This patient, when we look at these two volumes, the core is 56, the penumbra is smaller at 46. There is no difference here, right? This is a patient with no mismatched or a matched deficit. And these are patients that I would argue are pretty unlikely to benefit from you doing a thrombectomy procedure. But do we have data to actually show that that's the case? Um, this is a really important study. And I found that I think people don't know enough about it. And this is the FRAME study, which is done by our colleagues in France. And this is really asking, does the mismatch profile matter, particularly in early window patients? So what FRAME did, all patients um, with, uh, that were included got perfusion imaging, all right? Um, we don't know in early time windows if we should necessarily be relying on perfusion imaging because a lot of the studies in early, early time windows didn't use it and the field doesn't necessarily use it. So how do we sort out whether we should be doing perfusion in early time windows? Well, that's what Frame's gonna get at. So we, they took patients with large vessel occlusions within zero to six hours from symptom onset. They did perfusion in all patients, but they didn't process it, they didn't look at it. Right? They just got the imaging and then they treated the patient. And then afterwards, they processed the perfusion imaging and they said, well, let's look at how patients did based upon what their perfusion profile was, even though we didn't know what, what that was at the time that we, we treated them. And here's the results from frame. So patients who have a target mismatch and were treated, 61% of them were functionally independent at 90 days. Patients who ended up not having a target mismatch did not do so great. Only 35% of them did well. And this is really kind of the good outcome rate that we always see in medical arms. So if you do the math here, this is, gives you an adjusted odds ratio of 3.3, which is a pretty impressive treatment effect. But I think this is a really nice way to ask this question and really shows that if you are not doing perfusion early on, you're gonna treat a lot of patients without a mismatch who are not likely to do very well, okay? So, Hopefully that's good data to say that the concept of a mismatch is worth identifying even in early time windows. Um, and I actually think that that's very likely to be true and something we should be cognizant of. Um, can you use perfusion to guide thrombolysis? Just a couple slides on this. There are actually data that you can use CTP uh, to guide thrombolysis decisions with tenecteplase or TPA. This has been, been studied and is being studied in a lot of these, uh, these ongoing trials. Um, this is a nice uh, study from, again, from Bruce Campbell. This is in the Lancet. And this is looking at TPA in patients with or without a mismatch. And what you see is patients with a mismatch do have a benefit to getting uh, TPA versus patients without a mismatch. In this group, the placebo actually did you know, slightly better, although it was not statistically significant. And if you look at the numbers here, there's about a 10% or so benefit to uh, TPA administration in patients with a mismatch. And that translates not only to excellent outcomes, but our more traditional marker of good outcomes where there's an 11% benefit. So this is not something we're routinely doing, but these ongoing studies are asking, well, can we actually start to use this even in later time windows to decide which patients should get TPA or tenecteplase? And I think it'll be very interesting uh, to see the results of these studies. And I would guess that it may be helpful in expanding our use of, of thrombolysis in later time windows. And um, more people in Europe are starting to do this based upon MRI uh, profiles with DWI flare mismatch, um, but we'll have to see what the results are to see if we'd start to do this more in the United States. Okay, so we're starting to wind down a little bit. I wanna talk about some of the challenges that the uh, stroke field is facing, uh, technology and how CTP can help mitigate some of these issues. So a big thing um, that I think everybody struggles with is late window patients. When Dawn and Diffuse 3 were published, they were markedly positive. And that now suddenly meant that patients with large vessel occlusions could be treated 16 to 24 hours after last known normal. 
And so this is what happened to our thrombectomy volume after those studies. It's just gone up and up and up and up. And this creates a good opportunity to help people, but it also really creates some system, uh, systemic challenges that you've got to figure out what to do. And you know, here we are smiling. This is a, one of my former fellows, Ben Poli and I, and this is a night where we've done two thrombectomies and triaged a third, and you know, we're smiling and exhausted, but fundamentally, how do you deal with this increase in patient transfer volume? Okay, we have to have a way to do that. And I'm gonna argue that imaging is really helpful here. So we really need our community hospitals to do a little bit more of the legwork and identify potential treatment candidates before they're being transferred to your thrombectomy center. It would be really nice if we can predict what happens after they're transferred and can automation and artificial intelligence help us out here. So I'm gonna make an argument that actually perfusion imaging in the community is really, really helpful. And what do I mean by that? Well, again, our ideal thrombectomy candidate that we would really like to know if that's the patient we're transferring would have a small core, a larger penumbra and a large vessel occlusion, okay? So when I first started practicing, this is the kind of information we would get when we would transfer patients. They would have a non-con CT and the referring hospital would say, well, you know, there's a little bit of hypodensity, uh, you know, the basal ganglia. They would describe the symptoms and you would surmise a stroke scale that was high, but you wouldn't even necessarily have a CT angiogram and you would transfer patients over. And a certain amount of the time, they would actually not even have a large vessel occlusion. Then we would add in CTA and it got at least more accurate. We would, you know, find out that we were bringing patients with, you know, a large vessel occlusion, but you'd still be stuck with the limitations of a non-con CT. So what if we start to move then towards perfusion? Well, it'd be great if a community hospital could give you all these data, right? It could give you a core estimation, but doing perfusion and a CTA at every small little hospital, that, that's actually very difficult and it's a strain on their radiology resources. And they're kind of doing the whole imaging setup that you're gonna do at a comprehensive stroke center. Can you simplify this and still get all the information? Well, what if you use perfusion instead of a CTA? Do you need a CTA to find that you have a large vessel occlusion? I don't think you do. And so if you look at these three CT, uh, CT perfusion maps, you're all looking at this and you know these patients have a large vessel occlusion. And not only that, you know likely where they are. You look at this patient, you can see the whole MCA is affected. Well, that's an M1 or an ICA occlusion, right? You can look at this patient and say, okay, well, that's going to the inferior frontal gyrus. That looks like a superior division M2 occlusion. You can look at this patient with temporal and parietal lobe uh, perfusion deficit, and you know that that's an M2 inferior division. So if you're a community hospital and you do perfusion, you could actually get all this information. And how accurate is it? Well, if you use just perfusion and say, well, how accurately does that triage patients for thrombectomy with just knowing those two components, really, really high sensitivity and specificity. And so we actually been doing this at Stanford and have found it to be really, really helpful where a lot of our referring hospitals now have perfusion imaging that we can see on a mobile app and use that to make treatment decisions uh, remotely and transfer decisions. So does it work in the real world? These are just a couple of examples I pulled. Here's one patient, right? Clearly we see there's a small core and a penumbra. You look at this penumbral pattern, it looks like it's within the whole of the MCA territory. This is someone I would think has an M1 occlusion. And sure enough, that's what they have on the CTA. This is a patient with a really high stroke scale and a gaze preference, but this is their CT perfusion imaging. So no core and absolutely no penumbra. So I'm gonna guess this patient actually does not have a large vessel occlusion and they probably have a different problem. Maybe they're seizing and sure enough on the CTA, there is no large vessel occlusion. I don't yet know what the diagnosis is for their symptoms, but this is not a thrombectomy candidate. So no need to mobilize your entire stroke system uh, to do a potential thrombectomy in a patient like this. So this patient, number one, I would know they've got a large core. I see different than the large core patient I showed you earlier. We're getting into the sensory motor strip. Um, and when I look at the perfusion, I say, well, look, it goes pretty medial and high up. This looks like a patient with an ICA occlusion on the right side. And sure enough, the internal carotid artery is blocked in this patient. So you can really discern that there is a large vessel occlusion and where it's located using your perfusion software. And again, it's helpful to know patients like this too, right? Where there's not that difference between the core and the penumbra. This would be a patient you'd say, well, yeah, there's probably an inferior division M2 that's blocked, but look, it's matched. Right, this is not someone that's likely to be a thrombectomy candidate. So automation can help because now we can get this type of information on our phones through the web portal and being able to kind of look at what's going on physiologically as we're talking to referring hospitals, I think really helps us out. You know, these are just screenshots from my own phone and the fact that you can see all this 
and and really have that available to you wherever you are, I think is really pretty amazing. And I think that this is a space in uh, medicine where we're actually moving forward much faster than the traditional pace of uh, adoption of change. And I think that that's full credit to the stroke community in making this work this well. Okay, so just a real quick bit on can CTP predict the future? So what if you see this on your email, this looks like a treatment candidate, but they're a long ways away. Do we think there's still going to be a treatment candidate after we transfer them? Um, how good your collaterals are determine whether your core stays small or whether it grows quickly. And if you've got really good collateral blood flow, your core will stay small. If you've got bad collaterals, your core will grow. And usually we look at collaterals on CTA. Right, and so we say this patient's got really poor collateral blood flow. I don't see any arteries in this area at all. Whereas this patient has really good collateral blood flow, right? And, and if you can see the CTA, that's helpful to kind of assess and give you a sense of what's likely to happen. But how do you judge collateral blood flow on perfusion imaging if that's what you've got? How do you do that? Well, you can use something called the hypoperfusion intensity ratio. And so what this is, is you take the volume of tissue with very bad blood flow delay, Tmax greater than 10 seconds, and you divide it by the volume of, of brain with a less severe blood flow of Tmax greater than six seconds. So you wanna look like this patient where there's less red, than this patient. I think that intuitively makes sense to all of us. And so if you do that, this is really measuring tissue level perfusion and tissue level collaterals. And so if you have an HIR of 0 0.4 to 0 0.5 or less, you've got good collaterals and above that you have poor collaterals. So these are just a few of the papers our groups put out about this. It seems to be very effective as a way to measure um, uh, collaterals at the in, in the tissue on perfusion imaging, but I'm more interested in this problem. So this is one of my patients who's 56 year old guy, uh, left hemiplegia, right gaze, high stroke scale. This is the CTP at the outside hospital. So no core uh, and obviously a big penumbra. It looks like a great treatment candidate. The problem is they're 175 miles away from Stanford down in Fresno. And transferring patients over these distances is not easy and it takes a lot of time. So what's gonna happen, oops, what's gonna happen during that time that we transfer the patient? Well, if we look at this, we can actually look at the different thresholds and we can get their HIR, which in this patient is 0 0.3. That's a good favorable number. So this is a patient I think would probably not grow their core too much. And we actually looked at this in this really nice study uh, that Adrian wrote a number of, of years ago now. And so if you look at, well, what's the HIR versus the infarct growth, you see an inflection point here between 0 0.4 and 0 0.6, where the higher HIR patients grow their cores during transfer, and many of them were no longer thrombectomy candidates. So in this patient, here's the helicopter landing at the hospital more than five hours later, so a very long transfer. And here's how we started. So here's the areas of, of very prolonged blood flow in red. And here's the MRI at Stanford. So we can see the core ends up being 28. So bigger than zero, it was at the outside hospital, but you can see it really looks like it's matched to this area of red. And that's still an acceptably small core for treatment and they still have a mismatch, right? So this is a good thrombectomy candidate who underwent successful treatment for internal carotid artery occlusion. So HIR is really giving us information about tissue level collateral flow. Um, whether it accurately predicts core growth is something that we think it does. And this is undergoing prospective validation with the CRIS-2 study uh, and Martin Landsberg at Stanford is the PI uh, of that study. Okay, so that's a lot of information we talked about. And just to wrap up before we answer any questions. So CTP uh, is really quite a valuable tool um, for evaluating patients for thrombectomy triage, particularly as we talk about transferring patients between institutions. Um, we talked about the limitations and some of the pitfalls of CTP. And I think the biggest thing I can remind everybody is always look at that non-contrast CT. That's really, really critical to make sure we don't make an, an error in our interpretation. And I think that this is something that's really useful to us. And with that, I'll stop with this picture of uh, Stanford University's campus. And thank you all again for the invitation uh, to talk to you today. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Dr. Dr. Hyde. It was an amazing lecture, very useful for us, the fellows. Uh, Dr. McDougall, if you want to make any comments before I jump to the questions. Uh, you, you are mute. Yeah, still mute. Try hand signals, Cameron. <laughs> I, I can start with a few, with one question and then you, you, you can make a comment. Uh, so 
my first question is about one of your papers about the, the one that relates correlates venous outflow with uh, with collaterals. Mm -hmm. so could could you please uh, maybe bring some insight on that one? Yeah, so this has been a really fun area that we uh, we've delved into in the last couple of years. And and so one thing that's always bothered me a little bit is the field has been very focused on arteries. And, and it makes sense, right? I mean, half of this talk was showing you you block an artery, um, you know, that's a problem in a stroke patient. But if you're really thinking about what's going on to the brain tissue, you can block an artery, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you understand what blood flow is getting to the brain tissue itself. And I think this talk hopefully showed you that perfusion can really show you what's getting to the brain tissue itself. But what about brain exiting or blood flow exiting the brain? So we've all seen hemorrhagic strokes for patients who have a venous sinus thrombosis. So we know that venous egress really matters. And so it kind of makes sense that if you have a patient who's got an arterial blockage, really good collateral flow, and that patient can get that flow through the brain so that the circuit continues, you've got really good venous outflow, that they're going to do really well versus someone where they can get the blood flow to the brain. But like, what if the egress is slow? You've got kind of an outflow obstruction. And so what we've actually found on CTA, looking at venous um, opacification, is that venous outflow seems to be a really strong predictor of everything you want to know about a stroke patient. It predicts collateral flow, predicts whether they grow their core, seems to predict um, whether they develop malignant edema. Um, we've got a paper under submission right now that shows it predicts reperfusion hemorrhage, and it's a strong predictor of outcome. And so I think what the field needs to start doing is kind of starting to think about the brain as more of a circuit than just an inflow problem. Uh, we even have a paper in Stroke recently that suggests that TPA may not just act on the artery, it may have some role in venous outflow, which I think is really intriguing because if you take a patient and do a thrombectomy and now you've restored the arterial inflow, what if you've got like a microvascular thrombosis and poor outflow, then you've got this now blood flow that can't get through the tissue. And so if TPA helps that outflow stay open, now when you restore blood flow, you can you know, get the, the brain perfusing normally, wash out all the, the injurious you know, crap that needs to go away and hopefully uh, help lead to a better outcome. So I think a lot of a lot more research is needed in this space. And we're starting to see more publications on, on venous outflow uh, come through the literature from not just our group. Great. So second question is about your, your work on non-contrast dual energy CT. <laughs> Versus. Yes. Mm -hmm. So this is another area that I think uh, we need new technology. And so some of the things I showed you guys today, um, the challenges of non-contrast CT and seeing edema and seeing injury uh, to ischemic brain, it's hard and it's just not that good. What we really like to see is the, the kind of sensitivity we get from a diffusion weighted image. And so can we, you know, take CT, which is much more widely available, um, pretty much any emergency department can get a CT on, on anybody, but can we come up with technology that lets that CT technology show us something that looks closer to a diffusion weighted image? And what we've found with dual energy CT is you actually may be able to see edema in the brain much more easily than a conventional non-contrast CT. And that may help us not only identify stroke patients, but get a better estimate on just a non-con CT of how much injury there is. Um, and we would think that that might do better than aspects. Uh, and that's actually something that we're starting to, to look at here. Uh, and also to use uh, AI type of approaches to really characterize and outline that edema better. Okay, regarding AI, wh where do you think we, we are now regarding the uh, um, automatization of uh, aspects. You mentioned a few words about that, but where do you think that's going? Yeah, I think um, there's kind of two camps that I think uh, are, are in the field. And I think this is probably going to continue to some degree. So, you know, if you're using a CT perfusion and you are kind of consistently getting a core estimation, well, in that sense, you know, aspects may be a little bit less useful to you because you're getting more of a volumetric estimation, which may be more helpful. But if you're at a place where you are not doing that and you're probably then using aspects. And again, the real problem with aspects is people don't agree on it. And if it's a high aspect, that probably doesn't matter too much. But what if you're hovering around that aspects of six or five and you start to say, well, they are or are not a, a treatment candidate. Um, some of the automated aspects modules that are out there from commercial vendors seem to actually outperform some radiologists. 
I don't think we have enough data to know how widespread that is or whether that's you know just related to these selected publications. I think that'll be interesting to get a little bit more information about. But I do think the big advantage is if you're at a referring hospital and you don't have CT perfusion, but you have a non-con CT, well, then maybe automated aspects is, is going to be helpful, right? Because you don't necessarily have a neuroradiologist reading your scan. There are certainly some underserved areas where getting a prompt radiology read is challenging. You as a neuroventualist, you know, even though you're really good at looking imaging, you might not be able to see the source images or window it. So having some kind of way electronically that standardly assesses aspects uh, and you're used to it and familiar with it, I think that that's really beneficial. Um, I think that there's a lot of room for AI in, in medicine in general. And I, I kind of get the sense we're on this cusp of something that could be pretty revolutionary. And, uh, you know, we're doing work here at Stanford too with even taking just a non-con CT and trying to identify how much injury there is and comparing that to the performance of, of radiologists. And we're, we're seeing pretty compelling results that, that the AI is doing pretty darn well. Okay. You, you were speaking about the ghost core and uh, delayed recruitment of collaterals. So what do you think is the, the ideal time window for a CTP, considering, considering these two extremes? I think that CTP is always helpful. Um, I think that one needs to be aware of the limitations of it. And I think that goes for anything we do, right? We always need to know what's the limitations of our, of our techniques, even if it's a treatment technique. Um, you just need to know in those really early window patients about this so you don't make an error. And I, I don't actually think that that's too likely to be a problem at most thrombectomy centers because patients who get into the hospital you know, within 90 minutes, I think almost everyone's gonna treat those patients. And so I, I don't think that that's gonna be a big risk in excluding a patient. I do think there's a chance that if you see that CTP with a ghost core and they're in Fresno, like I showed you, you might be inclined to not transfer that patient. I think that's the real danger um, of CTP and hyperacute time windows. And I would still rather have the information knowing that, you know, there is a large vessel occlusion and some sense of, of you know, what's going on. But um, that's why I show that case is that we don't want to make that, that error. But otherwise, you know, for early time windows, zero to six hours, I think CTP is helpful. And I think I find frame to be very compelling. If you don't do frame, I think you're likely taking a certain number of patients with a match deficit that are just not gonna do well. And um, you know that, that has uh, implications. You're doing something that may not be helpful that puts a patient at risk. And you know, there's also, I think, resource um, questions that the field has to grapple with as well. Okay. So th 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 there was a, a paper on stroke in 2009. I wanted to ask about that because it was about the different TMAX times, time windows, like the different TMAXs. For to define penumbra, like two, four, mm -hmm. six, eight, and they said that two seconds was like the optimal T max to define penumbra. What do you think about it? Because we, as a standard, we use six. Yeah, it depends. I think part of the problem when you're saying, well, what what threshold best estimates the you know the penumbra compartment uh, versus the core compartment? Um, you have to keep in mind that it depends a lot on your software. Okay, and you know, rapid is going to process things very differently from Viz, which is going to be different from Brainomics. And so you really want to know, well, what's the performance of each company's product um, across data? And related to that question, you have to make sure you understand the definition of penumbra. Okay. So, and that's really important because what if you just mean, well, how, how much brain is just not getting enough blood flow? Well, then maybe Tmax2 says, yeah, you know, you got delayed blood flow. When I'm talking about penumbra, uh, and what I showed you in this talk, that is tissue that we really think if you don't open up the blood vessel, it will go on to permanently infarct. Okay, and so that, that's a, it's a predictive definition. And so there are good data, at least uh, with the rapid software, to use Tmax6 as something that's predictive of that. And so if you look across you know, diffuse one, two, and three, um, those studies help to refine this threshold. And if you don't successfully revascularize a patient, in general, that Tmax6 will go on to infarct. Um, and that's why you know, most of us are familiar with using that. It's been driven by the data from those studies. Okay. Uh, uh, we saw that you were involved in a few studies, I mean, trying to identify predict, predict uh, factors that could predict ICH or reperfusion bleeding with CTP. Mm -hmm. What do you think about it? What are your 
Any insight? Yeah, that? yeah. This is. Um, I think this is an interesting. Uh, it, it's an interesting topic, and I just want to emphasize that any imaging predictor of reperfusion hemorrhage right now has no role in excluding patients from treatment. Okay, so for example, patients who have very, very low cerebral blood volume, there's literature that that can be, you know, something that may predict an increased risk of a reperfusion hemorrhage. Um, that does not mean if you see a very low cerebral blood volume, you should say, well, I'm not going to treat the patient. I'm worried about them bleeding. That's not the right way to think about it. I think what that tells us is, can that, if it's reliable, help us identify a population that we need to study more? and develop new therapies that we do not have. Um, and so, for example, if you find this patient, you say, well, they have very low cerebral blood volume, that's gonna predict a massive reperfusion hemorrhage. Okay, well, those are the patients, what, what neuroprotective therapy or what maneuver can we do to reduce that risk of hemorrhage? And let's randomize those patients in a study to test that idea. You know, is it aggressive blood pressure control? Can we come up with some small molecule that stabilizes the blood brain barrier and reduces this breakthrough breathing? I think that's where these imaging markers um, are going to have an increased importance in the field. And that's just one example. I've become increasingly interested in who do I think will not do well because we're doing a great job at knowing who we can really help. The ones that aren't going to benefit, those are the ones we need new therapies in. So let's identify those groups. And that's where we got to focus our energy on now. We've, we've already picked the low hanging fruit and we know like, okay, we know that to treat the proximal vessel occlusion with a small core, like, great, we know that works, but let's figure out who, who else we can help that we don't have good therapies for. Okay, my last question is about the CTP for distal occlusions. What do you think about it, yeah? Yeah, this will be interesting. Um, you know, that we just had our, our SNIS meeting in Toronto um, uh, last month, and there was a lot of attention on, you know, progressively going more and more distal uh, talking about medium and distal vessel occlusions. I think the field is, is again, we've done the low hanging fruit. So let's see well, where else can we help. And I think that these distal vessels are the next frontier. Not a lot of discussion about using perfusion in these patients. Um, I think number one, I think perfusion is really good at identifying the presence of a distal vessel occlusion, right? It just makes it so much easier to see than scrolling through on a CTA and trying to find that, that vessel cut off, you know, somewhere within the sylvian fissure that you might miss. Um, but if you have a perfusion deficit, that'll kind of point your nose right where you need to look on the CTA and be very helpful. And then I think it's also going to be really important to think about, well, can CTP give us some, some predictive information? Because we don't want to necessarily be going way far out there and opening up a uh, tissue that's already dead. But, you know, we're going to have to rethink core and penumbra thresholds. Um, you know, do those sort of standard thresholds we're using for predicting core still apply in distal vessels? We need to generate that data and understand it. And then, you know, perhaps it's appropriate then to apply it and selection criteria for, for future studies. But I, I think it, it should be really thoughtfully considered and it may be potentially quite helpful. Okay, great. Dr. McDougall, any remarks, questions? Uh, the microphone is still... Uh... <laughs> let's, let's give him a few seconds. He, he got he got zoomed. The zoom era. Yeah. He's taking camera out. <laughs> is that working now? <laughs> yeah. There we go. My earpiece is killing me today. Um, that was a great uh, presentation, Jeremy. Really appreciate it. Really appreciate the discussion. Uh, good questions. You, you talked about pushing uh, perfusion studying out into the community hospitals, which you know help to predict patients to transfer in. Um, that seems challenging. I mean, the, the, in, in terms of just the quality we have is of the CTP sometimes in our own institution and, and really the techs and all that. I'm wondering about uh, multi-phase uh, CT, if that's something you've sort of looked at and compared or thought about. Yeah, it's not something we've done at Stanford, Cameron. I think um, it, it's in the same kind of vein, right? And, and I think what that would be is it's another tool to try to get more information than just the straight uh, CTA. Um, it's to some degree, you know, multi-phase CT is kind of the poor man's perfusion. You're, you're doing a similar thing in that you're scanning multiple times. You're just not doing it as often as you are for perfusion. But I do think it adds additional data. And we know from the ESCAPE trial that it, it's helpful in triaging thrombectomy patients. 
Um, I think there are companies now that have been commercialized to start to look at that. I don't think they're as broadly available. So I, I think it could be useful. Go ahead. What, what I'm really thinking about is just um, what you can realistically achieve in the in the community hospitals that are you know that Got are yeah. have hospitals. Whether whether yep. whether perfusion is something we can really push out in, into the field. Well, what I would say there is uh, our experience is, is yes, you definitely can. Um, you know, to some degree, when you talk about radio radiology technologists, you just have to spend a little bit of effort to make sure they're trained. And then making sure the scanners got the protocol programmed. And mm -hmm. then once you kind of have those two pieces and you make sure your, your safety guardrails are on there, that they're giving the right dose, that's really critical. Um, then it kind of becomes just doing it right and pushing the button. And the rest of it, frankly, the processing is automated. You know, mm -hmm. it's not like the CT techs are doing any of the processing. This is being done by these companies over the cloud. And for us, you know, we have a lot of small hospitals and that commonly send us patients that now have it, and uh, we get the results on our phones, and it's spectacularly useful. And so that, at least in our experience, shows me it's certainly feasible, and it actually seems to perform really well. You know, that's really uh, appealing, the idea of, you know, not transferring in that patient who, you know, reliably, you can predict is going to progress in that during that transfer. That really is a, would be a huge uh, help. I think it's, and I think importantly, it's also really good for patients in the community. You know, you talk about yeah. taking a patient away from their family, hundreds of miles to another hospital, when you're not going to really treat them. Um, as long as the, the initial hospital is able to support them through their, their stroke and they don't have other high level care needs, they're in their community, they're closer to their family, their home. That's a good thing. You know, that, that's good for the system. It's a huge, huge resource uh, saving is just even just the air transfers. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Good questions, guys. Yeah, well, really, really great discussion. Really appreciate being with us uh, here this morning, Jeremy. And, and thanks so much for your time. Yeah. No, thank you, guys. This is a lot of fun. And uh, let's do it again sometime. Sure. Wonderful. Take care. Have a great day. All right. Thank you so much. Cheers, guys. Bye-bye.